Coming up on our next installment of America's Hope, he's a French-Israeli journalist who has covered stories talking to Hamas terrorists, Al-Qaeda, as well as Islamic jihadists. Hear his riveting story about suicide bombers and people who are determined to wipe Israel off the face of the map. Next on America's Hope. Good evening, I'm Kelly Wright, and this is America's Hope. And we welcome you to our program. We always appreciate your taking time out of your busy schedule just to sit down and watch what we're talking about as it relates to what's happening in the world and trying to give you a dose of hope. Tonight, hope might appear to be a little difficult because of the subject that we're talking about. We're talking about the Israel-Hamas war and we're going to focus on this from an Israeli perspective from the French-Israeli journalist, Pierre Rehov. He's a journalist who's been around the world covering so many difficult subjects. And we're not gonna delay it any longer. Let's get right to it. And you will be startled to hear some of his insights as a journalist still living in Israel and some of his discussions that he's had with Hamas terrorists and others. Let's get started. My first guest is Pierre Rehoff. He's a French-Israeli reporter, writer, and documentary filmmaker. Uh, he's been covering conflicts in the Middle East for some 25 years now, and he's one of the few journalists to have actually interviewed dozens of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and Al-Qaeda terrorists and to have been embedded with the U.S. military and his groundbreaking documentary, Suicide Killers, well, it sheds light on the psychopathological aspects of suicide terrorists and what motivates them, what compels them to do what they do. And he's also released, uh, that, that particular documentary was released worldwide days after the 7-7 London subway bombings in 2005. Rehov joins us now from Ashdod, Israel, just 10 miles north of Gaza. And Pierre, thank you for joining us. It's so, so important to have Good you pleasure. here with us. I got to ask you right now, what's the, what's the atmosphere like where you live in Ashdod, which is only uh, 10 miles away from, from Gaza? Uh, that's kind of uh, difficult because my wife and I have been living in Israel for quite a long time now. So I used that. I, I was covering the war in 2014 and, you know, the rockets and all that. It's almost part of the, the life each time we have uh, a war or uh, a fighting with the Hamas or with Gaza. But in this case, it's a little bit different from us because each time we rush to the shelter, sometimes in the middle of the night, uh, the baby is either, either uh, asleep or even if she's awake we have to play games we have to to sing and dance while the bombs are exploding above our heads so that's a striking experience uh, beside that Ashdod itself is a little bit calm I would say uh, that's another statement people go out and need to go to the supermarkets and uh, to buy food or to the pharmacy there, it used to be a very animated city it looks a little bit like Los Angeles actually Tel Aviv looks a little bit like Manhattan and Ashdod looks like Los Angeles. I've been living in both cities, so I can actually talk about it. And uh, this atmosphere of a beach um, city is no longer there. I mean, you can feel the tension, even though the beaches are beautiful and the sun is shining and it still is hot, uh, like in summer. I mean, not that much, but, you know, kind of warm climate. The rest of the time you, you see the people, you talk to the people, and one thing is interesting, which is before October 7, as you know, Israel had a lot of internal conflicts. There was this reform of the, this judicial reform and a lot of uh, parades and uh, people disagreeing with it. And you had the, the right against the left and the religious against the non-religious and the extremists against, I mean, everybody was kind of fighting with each other inside Israel. But you know, it's part of Jewish culture. 
uh, you have uh, two Jews in, uh, in, the, in the room, you have three opinions, but uh, that's a <laughs> usual state. So that was the atmosphere before October 7. But now Israel is a block of uh, concrete and steel. Everybody is together. The Haredim, I mean, the, the, the ultra religious, we didn't want to go to the army, are doing whatever we can to help the army. A lot of them are actually joining the army, which was unseen before. And the left wing people were always taking the side of the Palestinians and, you know, Shalom Arshad and all this organization. A lot of them, a lot within them, finally understood what we're dealing with. Here in America and throughout the world, you've seen people protest, and some even in favor of Hamas. I want to know how you and the Israeli people are responding to that kind of protesting going on. When you know a little bit what is going on within the Middle East, uh, as I think I do because I've been covering that for such a long time now, and I, I've been everywhere. I mean, I was in Iraq, I was in Gaza, I was in Ramallah, I was in, uh, you name it. Uh, and I know a lot of people there, and I've talked to a lot of people. The people that Pierre Rehab is speaking about are members of Hamas, men and women, that he personally interviewed in his documentary, Palestinian Jihad. In their own words, they expose the frightening threat from Hamas. I only wanted military missions, but because of what the Jews are doing, the minute I get the mission inside Israel, I will blow myself up. Whether it's in a house, a room, and there are civilians and children. What I did, I wanted to become a martyr. I saw a friend and told him what I wanted, and he agreed. I put the belt on and went to a checkpoint. For the Palestinians, all the prisoners caught by Israel are heroes. The person who has sacrificed himself for his country is certain he'll be beloved. I must add that we don't only fight against occupation. Our goal is to spread Islam to all, everywhere. I will not feel sorry for any Israeli kid, and I will not regret, even if it is a nursery full of kids, it's enough that I will be a martyr and I will go in front of God. Representing my family, 70 people, my wife, my children, my sisters, and all my friends. 70 people will go to paradise on my merit. This is a big honor for me. It's written in the Quran. When a martyr blows himself up, it's beautiful. It feels so good. He doesn't feel any pain, only pleasure. And even dead, he wants to do it again and again. By God, if we chase the Jews from Palestine and the Holy Temple, and they don't surrender to Islam, even if they go to the end of the world, we shall chase them and kill them. And then we will call all the Christians to Islam, because this is the only religion of compassion. Uh, what we know is that all those uh, parades in America and other places in the world, they are not spontaneous. It was kind of organized. Those are sleep terrorist sleeping cells. They have been there for a long time. You certainly know my friend Steve Emerson, who had been covering for many, many years also. He wrote Jihad in America like 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And this is what is happening. A lot of the mosques are actually are covering within their, their walls uh, small organizations. I'm not talking about all the mosques, obviously, but some of the mosques are just terrorist uh, bases. They are just, uh, uh, they are just covering and, uh, and protecting uh, Salafists and other uh, extremists from, uh, from Islam, Islamists. So that's not a surprise that the day after a gigantic pogrom something that has not been seen since World War II in the Western world, 
after, just the day after women were raped and uh, pregnant women had their belly opened and the fetus killed and children were tied together and burned alive and babies mm. were beheaded and uh, uh, civilians were machine gun and taken hostages. The day after, people started parading, not for the Jews, not for the victims, not because of the, this new Holocaust or Shoah, just for the Palestinians. So this is not an accident. This was really well prepared in advance. It was beyond terrorism. They killed the people with their very hands and they killed whatever they could find and they tortured whatever they could find. It's not terrorism, it's pure Nazism. And this is encrypted in some part of, of Islam, I'm sorry to say, because, you know, it's a could be a nice religion and a lot of people are practicing practicing Islam in a very nice way. But among them, you have a lot of extremists. I'm, I'm talking to Pierre Rehoff. We're gonna take a break and when we come back, we're gonna continue our discussion with Pierre about the, the, the terrorist activities and the Islamic Jihad that's unfolding uh, from Hamas and other factions and why he has concerns about that particular brand of terrorism spreading and how it could even come to the shores of America, if not already here. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to America's Hope. So I've been talking to Pierre Rehoff. He's joining us now. He's a French-Israeli reporter, a writer, and documentary, documentary filmmaker. Uh, you live in the region. I have visited the region, and I know that there have been efforts uh, prior to this October 7th attack where you actually saw uh, Israelis and and Palestinians, uh, whether they're Christian Palestinians or Islamic Palestinians, actually trying to break bread together at a table of brotherhood with their Israeli friends. And in fact, we know that on October 7th, there were many uh, Israeli people, Jewish people who lived along that border with Gaza, who would yeah. actually help their Palestinian neighbors and friends. Uh, yeah. So I, I just want to interrupt you to bring that point to light. Uh, talk to me about that. Well, to talk about it in a very precise way, I would recommend that you watch my film called Terror, Racket and Corruption. Terror, Racket and Corruption, because I spent a few weeks going into the Palestinian territories, filming all the beautiful houses of their leaders, all the fantastic mansions of their leaders, and uh, whether it's Hamas or Palestinian Authority, and talking to people in the streets of Gaza and Ramallah and Hebron and asking them what's the situation from the field. And then you realize that you have a population which, which, that doesn't see any financial help, even though the international community sends billions of dollars to the Palestinians. And, uh, and, and those people are always wondering, asking, where is the money? And you go to Gaza and you have people telling you, well, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, they, they get everything, they keep everything. And when you know that the leaders like uh, Ismail Haniyeh and, uh, and Khaled Marshall, who live in Qatar and Istanbul, I mean, um, uh, Haniyeh goes from Istanbul to Qatar and uh, back and forth, and, uh, and Marshall is living in a five-star hotel uh, in Qatar. Both of them have stolen five billion dollars from the international community and from their people. And they are not in Gaza, uh, and they were not in Gaza when, Ga when the Gazans were committing this massacre, or now that Israel is retaliating. They are having a good life. And the more the Gaza is gonna be destroyed, their plan has always been that, the more the international community is gonna send money to rebuild it, and instead of rebuilding it, they're just gonna steal most of the money. Those are gangsters. They are not, they are not, they are nothing but gangsters. It's a mafia. That's what people have to understand. The more you support the Palestinians and you feel sorry for the Palestinians against Israel, the more the Palestinians are going to suffer. The only way, only way to make the Palestinians live happily beside Israel and actually one day having their country that they, they would want to have, some of them, it's by stopping to make all the time pressures on Israel. Talk to me about the propaganda war and, and what you know through your reporting about who's, uh, who's funding the propaganda war. Is it, is it Iran? Is it Russia? Is it China? Is it all of the above? It's all of the above. And you forgot the most important, Qatar. Qatar also is involved. Qatar, Russia, China. Very good point. 
but more also you have to understand European Union. They send millions of dollars to left-wing organizations within Israel or within the Palestinian territories. Like Beth Salem, for instance, it's an Israeli organization, but it's a pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel organization, always trying to find the good story to tell about what the soldiers might be doing in the Palestinian territories. And they are financed and they receive a lot of money for European Union. Welcome back to America's Hope. I'm talking to Pierre Rehov, a uh, French-Israeli reporter, writer, and documentary filmmaker. Pierre, you were talking previously about the fact that there is a threat of terror, not only for Israel, but also for people throughout the world who are Jewish and Christian, or even uh, Islamic people who don't follow the same type of uh, religion that their counterparts in terrorism follow, the jihadists. Right. What are, what's your what's your concern about the future of terrorism? We will not be able to stop terrorism until the moment people actually call the things for what they are. If you're looking at if you're reading the newspapers and if you're watching a lot of mainstream media, they don't even dare calling Hamas a terror organization. Lately slightly they started doing it a little bit because after the massacre of october 7 actually uh, you cannot escape from it you cannot hide it anymore but the problem is political political correctness you have to say the things the way they are because you have to understand that those jihadists are using the media the liberals uh, the left-wingers the communists uh, the, 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 the squad within the, Democrat, within the Democratic Party, uh, whether Rashida Tlaib or uh, Ilan Omar or AOC, uh, they are all on the same team, some because they are stupid, like AOC and Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, they are a little bit evil, but mostly stupid, and, uh, and they are using them. They are, you know, Lenin had a great word for those guys, they were the, <clears throat> the useful idiots. And those people are the useful idiots of Islamism, the useful idiots of terrorism. Uh, you know, I, I, I was born, I, I mean, I, I'm coming from France. I lived most of my life in France. And they, they, the, the jihadists came to it and killed more than 100 people. The next day, people were lighting candles all around France and saying, you're not going to have my hatred. What do you mean you're not going to have your hatred? Of course we are going to have your hatred if you want to survive. We are laughing at you. You're the laughing stock of the jihadists because this is what they do. They want you to to stick with your uh, usual, uh, you know, democratic point of view and and beautiful mind and liberal mind in some cases. And you feel sorry for the rest of the world and you want to help and blah blah blah. But bottom line, civis passet parabellum. If you want peace, you have to be ready for war. So, Pierre, first of all, that, that series, uh, the documentary Suicide Killers, it, it really, you can see in the faces of these teenagers, children actually, uh, how lost they are because of not being given the love and guidance, if you will, to, to help them choose a more productive life than becoming uh, someone who would become a suicide bomber. What right. do you think was going through the minds of the Hamas uh, terrorists who broke through and infiltrated uh, the kibbutzes and towns and villages in Israel on October 7th? You had two kind of people going into Israel on, on October 7th. First of all, you have the members of Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and those are trained, uh, not soldiers, but trained terrorists, but a lot of Palestinian civilians followed. And this is the mistake that the Hamas made, because I have to explain you something. Uh, Palestinians' strategy is to attack Israel, so Israel is going to retaliate, and then all the media of the world are going to go within the Palestinian territories and show 
how miserable and how uh, how many uh, victims they have and they are happy to show the dead bodies of children and the dead bodies of women and that's their victory because all the media are going to report on that in uh, on the other hand israel is very shy and uh, very respectful of its dead and we don't like to show our dead people so for many years the only dead you could see only dead people you could see except for some terror attacks during the Intifada, where actually some reporters would go on the field and be able to film, but very briefly, some dead bodies. But Israel didn't want to show them. This time, what happened is the people who followed Hamas, who were just normal civilians living in Gaza and more than happy to go commit a massacre just for fun. They were taking a high, they were taking drugs like captagon, which is the drug of the, of the, the, the terrorists, and it's produced in Syria. It's actually 80% of the of the growth of the whole country. They are exporting captagon all around the world, especially mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia, where they want to stop it. But anyhow, that's not the problem here. The problem is that those people, they were so proud of that of what they are doing, that they filmed themselves for the glory of massacring people. They filmed themselves opening the belly of a pregnant woman and taking the fetus out. They filmed themselves burning alive babies and burning alive uh, children. And they are proud of it. And those images are going absolutely everywhere in the world. I have 400 of them, videos, pictures, and it makes a big change because until now, Hamas for a lot of people it was Mother Teresa. It was, you know, the uh, social workers of Palestinian representing uh, freedom fighters of Palestine. And all of a sudden you realize it's just a bunch of psychopaths. It's uh, 4,000 Ted Bundy came into, into Israel and had fun for six hours committing the worst massacre in the history uh, of the 21st century, at least it was in the Western world. What they did is beyond abominable. For, I think even the Nazis didn't went all, all, all that way because the Nazis understood that they had to hide what they were doing. Yeah. And on the, other, on the other hand, those Palestinians didn't want to hide. They were so proud of it. So proud of it. They killed. You know what they did? They killed almost all the dogs they could find just for fun. And in one of the kibbutz, they killed with a machine gun 50 cows. Were the cows Jewish? Well, the Israelis, they were cows. They just machine gunned them. And they didn't stop for hours and hours. And I'm, I'm very worried also about the, the hostages. Those beautiful women who have been taken hostages during the, 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 you know, the, the, the music show that they, they were kidnapped from, so many of them, what do you think is happening to them? Some of them were paraded naked in the street of Gaza with all the people uh, chanting and distributing candies and they were so happy to see that and now the the rest of the world is going to tell israel well you know be careful and uh, uh you have, you don't you should not have a proportionate response you should have a proportionate response to what they did uh i i i saw a very very good uh, i don't remember his name but a wonderful guy on, on uh, british television was saying are we, should as well be proportionate? Okay, so we're going to rape exactly the same number of Palestinian women that have been raped in the kibbutz. We're going to kill exactly the same number of children and we're going to burn alive exactly the same number of people and we're going to do exactly the same thing. This is what you want us to do? Sorry, but Israel doesn't do that. Yeah. So Israel is doing what? Retaliation, trying to target Hamas, trying to protect the civilians by telling them to go away. But Hamas doesn't want them to go away. They want to keep them as, as uh, human shields because this is for good for their propaganda. Again, we're back to showing dead bodies of children. And do you know what? 500 to 700 rockets fired at Israel, Israeli population didn't work and they fell into Gaza. How many people died of those Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad rockets? You know, all this, the media, the media do, don't want to cover because the story has to be simple. Bad Jews, good Palestinians. And it's been going on now for so many years. And they even want to go back to, to 
1948. And they even want to promote the Nagba, which is a lion, which is a, a mythology. And this is the heart of the problem. Their propaganda spread among people who actually want this propaganda and are very easy to target is the basic of their of their uh, appraising. And the whole idea is to invade the rest of the world, not only Israel. Israel is on the way. Israel is on their way. But one they want to destroy Israel. But the next target would be France or America. Pierre, uh, through, throughout your career, you, you mentioned earlier at the start of this program about Israel holding on to this this gift that we have from God called hope. I, what was the, the, the Hebrew name that you have for hope? Atigva. Atigva. So, so tell me what Atigva, I hope I said that right, uh, what's your, your Antigva, your hope for Israel and for America and for people who love freedom? Let's start with Israel. I really hope that Israel is going to defeat Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad completely and find a way to release all the hostages. Once this happens, we have to find a global government for all the Palestinians, a, a government capable of making peace with Israel and honestly accepting the very existence of Israel. That will lead to the end of the conflict here. In the meantime, my hope is that we expand the Abraham Accords to all of the region of the Saudi, of, of, including Saudi Arabia. And another hope is that America will wake up, and I think they are actually doing it now. Pierre Rehov, French-Israeli reporter, writer, and documentary filmmaker joining us tonight on America's Hope. We thank you for joining us this hour with some very important information and insights that you have provided. We appreciate you. Stay safe in Israel. And we pray for the best for the outcome that is really before I go. Before yes. I go, I would like to show you a picture taken in the main street of Gaza. Okay. For people who don't understand what we are dealing with, this is a very popular store in Gaza. And that's a picture that was recently taken in Gaza. Hitler yeah. too. Hitler too. Hitler too. That's the name of the store. Very pop popular fashion store in Gaza. What kind of store is it? Clothes, clothes store. A clothing a store. store. A clothing Named store. after Hitler. <laughs> Named after Hitler. And people are, like it very much. And all the mannequins in the, in, the, in, the, in the showroom carry a knife. Wow. I appreciate you, so my friend. It's uh, thank you. For, it's it's very difficult. I know it's a very difficult time for you as well, and for the people of Israel. And uh, uh, we thank you for weighing in on this and 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 your concerns, not only for Israelis but also for people even on the other side who are trying to live innocent lives and are caught up in this in this vicious um, in this vicious terroristic uh, activity from Hamas. Yeah. Appreciate you and joining us. In order to defeat Nazism, you had to bomb Berlin, and that's exactly what is happening now. Berlin yeah. to Gaza. And welcome back to America's Hope. Phyllis Chesler, PhD, Dr. Chesler, is an emerita professor of psychology at City University of New York. She is a best selling author a legendary feminist leader and a retired psychotherapist. And she's joining us now well, to talk about a lot of things that are going on in the world. Phyllis, uh, welcome to the program. You know, you have lectured and organized political, legal, religious, and human rights campaigns in the United States and other countries, including Canada, Europe, Israel, Central Asia, and the Far East. So today, there are so many things going on in all of those regions. Talk to me, if you will, about how you see the world uh, in regard to what's happening in Israel, what's going on with China and the CCP, the whole nexus of things that's happening. Well, all of us, not just 16 million Jews in Israel and in America are being held hostage by a terrorist funder, Iran, that we're funding, that America continues to fund uh, and of course, by Hamas and Hezbollah, which are very much like ISIS. So if you're merely an American, a civilian, and you 
take a car and you're driving it somewhere. Traffic may be held up by delusional demonstrators who are calling for the freedom of Palestinians, which really means to exterminate the Jews. And as they say, yes, it begins with the Jews. It's always bigger than us because America is in the crosshairs of Iran and Israel is doing our fighting for us now. And the disinformation that people have about everything I've just said is off the charts. And wow. I, as a psychologist, I cannot figure out how to teach people that they're not just persecuting and scapegoating Jews for the crimes of all humanity, but even were they, God forbid, to exterminate all the Jews, would it help the women in Afghanistan or in Sudan or in Egypt or the dissidents or the Muslims who are anti-Islamist and who themselves write under pseudonyms, even in the West? The answer is no, of course not. So there's a madness that has gripped the world and it's not surprising. I'm not surprised because I've been following this certainly for the entire 21st century, but I began in the 1970s to follow groupthink, indoctrination in the universities, beliefs, the belief that America is, as Iran says, the big Satan, and Israel is the little Satan. So this is the world that we're now in. Dis disinformation, indoctrination, brainwashing, and a hard-heartedness that's most incredible. You, you wrote a book called The New Anti-Semitism, uh, and, mm. and that book still rings true today. What is this new anti-Semitism and why is it rearing its ugly head? Uh, it, when I wrote it, even my editor said, why are you saying that it is coming to us from the Islamic world, which it is, and from the Western intelligentsia in an alliance, in a dreadful alliance. So I, I was challenge this couldn't be true you can criticize israel without being a jew hater but it turns out that i was right and today anti-zionism is anti-semitism and i lost friends and opportunities family members because i stood up for the jews and for israel because i see us as a symbol of western civilization of judeo-christian culture and that is what is under attack. And I began thinking about this a long time ago. And I have some deep thoughts about it. Um, I'll share one. In, in the Torah, in the Bible, the Old Testament, Cain kills Abel. And Abel's gift to God was accepted, was viewed positively. Cain's less so. And God, speaking as a mother, as a psychoanalyst, says, why has your face fallen down? If you try again, will you not succeed? You might succeed. But Cain felt so cursed, so unloved, so unchosen, lesser, that he killed his brother. And I think that this kind of psychology is also involved in anti-Semitism. And then for a thousand years, maybe a little bit more, the idea of redemption coming to the world through the sacrifice of a Jewish rabbi also played its role so that Jewish blood was seen as redemptive for the world. This is very problematic because I work with conservative Christians who are so pro-Israel, God bless them, more so than many secular liberal Jews are, which is so troubling and so sad, but understandable because the, the professors in our universities 
and our media and our international mm -hmm. human rights organizations, all of them, are politically correct, multicultural relativists, and most academics in America and in Europe have been Stalinized and Palestinianized for a very long time. So what's happening in the demonstrations and the resolutions against Israel in the hatred of America has been a long time coming. And for, for example, um, okay, if you're against racism, which I am, and against colonialism and against imperialism, Every culture has practiced these customs, practices, and slavery. And many Muslim countries still practice slavery, which is mainly black slavery and sex slavery. And the, uh, the academics in the West only want to hear about Israel as an apartheid nation state, which it's not, and absolutely won't hear about Islamic gender and religious apartheid, will not hear about Muslim involvement in the slave trade. Absolutely, when you, I, the first time I said this, it was at a grassroots conference called mainly by uh, African-American feminists, and they wanted me to talk about my book. Uh, at that time, it was Woman's Inhumanity to Woman. And when somebody stood up and asked me, where do you stand on the question of the women of Palestine? I said, yeah. I think you're asking me where I stand on the issue of apartheid and I oppose it. And let me tell you that the largest practitioner of apartheid is Islamic leaders, Islamic countries. And I was once held captive in Afghanistan and Kabul. So I know a bit about what I speak and the place this was at Barnard in 2003. The place went crazy. I had to be hustled out for my safety. Wow. And then, and then I needed police protection on American campuses after I'd been a professor for 30 years. This is 19, no, this is 2003, 2004. So when I read now about what's happening on college campuses, I'm very sad, I'm very angry, but I'm not surprised. And when I hear about uh, students, Jewish students for now, um, being locked in or needing police protection or not feeling safe or being doxxed or being harassed on the street yeah. or, or yeah. beaten, again, I'm angry, I'm disgusted, but I'm not surprised because you have such a level of propaganda demonization of the Jew and of the Jewish state, Israel, that it always leads to bloodshed, always. You have propaganda and it leads to bloodshed. I, I've got to ask you, uh, how, how did we get to this? Uh, did we not see this coming? We have uh, great intelligence services in the United States. Uh, did we not see this seeping uh, of information, misinformation creeping in to our college campuses and, and like you said, even to our media circles? Many of us did, but we were not listened to. We were Cassandras. We were the canaries in, in the mine. We were not believed. In fact, once I made a presentation at Columbia and a very prominent Jewish leader said, oh, you're the Jewish Cassandra. And I mm -hmm. said, oh, sir, I, I hope not because she was not listened to. Troy was destroyed and she became Agamemnon's sex slave. So please don't say that. Uh, but it turns out that I was right. And a good handful of others also were right about the anti-Americanism, the anti-religion, the anti-Israelism. The final question is, how do you help save millions of people from the current propaganda, misinformation, oh. miseducation of the masses? It will take, since it took 60 years to bring us to that way of wrongful thinking, 
it may take us as long to drain the swamps, to deprogram the brainwashed, and um, to do so in a fact-based, objective way. Because people who are in a cult or who've been brainwashed and are in a cult um, need to be deprogrammed. And I'm not sure how long that will take. And uh, we're up against a huge task. And like Israel at war, we also must strive to succeed in the task. So what's your hope for America, Israel, and the world? Oh, my hope is <laughs> we should be spared hatred. We should be spared war. Each human life should be treasured and oh we are so far from this and yet these are great goals these are ideals that we must keep in mind and in our hearts and in our actions dr phyllis chesler i appreciate meeting you thank you for being on today's program thank you for shining some information uh, in a very dark sea of misguided and misinformation. Appreciate you. Stay encouraged, my Thank friend. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you. Be happy to come back. So in closing tonight, my final word is this. Hope, it's difficult. Hope in a war zone, it's problematic. Hope in a place where terrorists are actually trying to kill you and annihilate you, it's the only thing you can hold on to because it's what gives you the resolve and the perseverance to stand up against a world that says you're wrong for standing up against the very people that want to annihilate you. And from that perspective, as we say in America, freedom ain't free. Sometimes you have to fight for it and guard it and protect it and keep hope in order to carry it through. You, America, keep holding on to hope. Stand strong. Good night. rip through the heart of the city, inflicting pain and casualty. A cowardly act of despicable terror, increasing fear and misery. Oh, it's so crazy. The way we're living our lives oh, it's so crazy. This kind of living ain't right In times like these Do you ever wonder We need, we need a savior In times like these ever wonder we need a savior your broken heart so bruised and battered tearing apart at the seams your wounded life so torn and tattered filled with regrets and broken dreams crazy the way we're living this life oh, it's, so crazy. it's so crazy this kind of living ain't right in times like these do you ever wonder could it be we need a savior in times like these Lord, we need 
salvation. Please come and heal the nations. Lord, we need deliverance. Oh, please come and give us forgiveness. Well. Savior. Your America and my America. Unite. 